Hello, this will be your discussion on multiple sclerosis. So the keywords that we would want to remember in multiple sclerosis is that this is also characterized by demyelination. Okay, however, instead of PNS, instead of your cranial nerves and your peripheral nerves, the demyelination is occurring in your brain and your spinal cord. Hence, in other words, multiple sclerosis, it's demyelination of the central nervous system. So that differentiates your MS, as we commonly call multiple sclerosis, to your GBS or your galen barre syndrome. Now, let's talk about your uh, multiple sclerosis. So this is a chronic autoimmune disease affecting the myelin sheath. That's why I mentioned demyelination and the conduction pathways of your CNS. So this type of disorder is said to be chronic, progressive, it's non-contagious, and it's a degenerative disease of your CNS. Okay, so you have the words chronic, progressive, and it's not contagious. So plus, it has also its autoimmune implications. So which means that it has a lot of similarity to your GBS. However, the areas affected is different. Okay, so class for your multiple sclerosis, what is affected is your CNS. On your GBS, it is your PNS. Now, so class your multiple sclerosis is characterized by your exacerbation and remission. Meaning, if your patient has multiple sclerosis, it could be chronic, meaning it could last for a lifetime class. However, there are moments of exacerbation and remission. So when I say remission, there are times that your patient will not be experiencing the signs and symptoms of your multiple sclerosis. And there are times that these signs and symptoms are exacerbated or exaggerated. And the, class, the end result is progression okay, uh, with increasing loss of function. So if you would notice class, no, this is an example of a nerve which is affected by your multiple sclerosis or its illustration, I mean. So you would notice that, that there is a damaged myelin. So instead because of a continuous signal being brought from this part okay, going toward this part class, what happens is that the signal tends to be broken. Okay, That's why your problems would have problems with or your patient would have problems with motors. Okay? Now etiology, Sichuan would say idiopathic. However, studies have shown that uh, in terms of genetics, the presence of your human leukocyte antigen is a predictor of your multiple sclerosis. In the environment class, you have your smoking, okay, and then you have your lack of vitamin D and exposure to your EBV or your Epstein-Barr virus, okay, which increases your risk for uh, your multiple sclerosis. Now, what is in the pathophysiology of your multiple sclerosis? Plus, the synthesized T-cells would remain in the CNS that would later promote infiltration of other agents. Okay, so these synthesized T-cells could be triggered by the presence of previous infection. Now, this would continuously damage the immune system, leading towards inflammation. And this inflammation is causing the demyelination of your axons. Okay, so plus there will be your oligodendroglia, which would interrupt the flow of your nerve impulses. So again, problem is demyelination. Now, because of this process, there are plaques that would appear along the demyelinated axons. This plaques class could be visible in your CT scan and your MRI. Now, it would lead to degeneration of your axons, and then that would lead to permanent or irrevers irreversible damage. Okay? It would slow also or weaken the transmission of your nerve impulses. Again, it would slow and weaken the transmission of your nerve impulse. Okay, so again, an illustration of a patient's uh, neuron with your multiple sclerosis. Okay, the same illustration class. No? So this uh, shows your degraded myelin, okay, uh, which would slow down the transmission of your nerve impulse. Then you have the clinical manifestations. It is very common class for a patient with multiple sclerosis to complain of fatigue. Okay, it's a very common complaint among your patient with multiple sclerosis. Depression is also increasing. Your patient is also having muscle weakness, numbness, and tingling sensation. They will have ataxia or uncoordinated movements, and then there will be tremors, loss of balance, and then you will be spasticity of the leg. Okay, class, your patient would also have pain. Okay, by the way, class, the tremor tends to be intentional. So when I say intentional tremors, no, this usually happens when your patient initiates movement. Okay, that is when your tremors would be occurring. Then, 
Okay, so you have here the signs and symptoms class now on a certain illustration. Uh, I think this is derived from Lippincott. So if you would look at this class, multiple sclerosis, okay, they would have autoimmune. Usually it's familial of origin. There is presence of tinnitus class and hearing problem because of the involvement of your vestibulocochlear nerve. Okay, there can be nystagmus, diplopia, okay, blurred vision, dysarthria, and dysphagia. So class in multiple sclerosis, your ocular signs and symptoms are very likely. So its onset is usually occurring among your patients ages 20 to 40. Okay? Your patient has a tendency or at higher risk for urinary retention, spasticity of the bladder, constipation, and the weakness may progress towards paralysis. Okay? There could be muscle spasticity, ataxia, and vertigo. Okay? So this is just a short reminder as to how your multiple sclerosis would usually present. Okay. So there are different kinds of uh, what you call this um, assessment findings that would trigger your uh, that would trigger you to suspect that your patient would have multiple sclerosis. Okay. So as I mentioned, verbal disturbances. There is blurring of vision. There is diplopia. There is scotoma, and then there is total blindness. In the sensory manifestations class, there is paresthesia, there is diesthesia. When I say diesthesia class, it is a sensation that people typically describe as painful, itchy, burning, or restrictive. And then class, you have your diesthesia. In your diesthesia, again, okay, uh, again class on diesthesia, that would mean abnormal sensation, which is usually, as I have mentioned, painful, burning, prickling, or aching feeling. So class, your patient would also manifest with uh, proprioception loss, meaning your patient is unable to detect their position or unable to identify their current position. Then, since there is involvement of your brain here, remember this is central nervous system. Okay, so central nervous system class, okay, there is involvement of your uh, brain. Notice that your patient would have cognitive changes. So there is a memory loss, impaired judgment, and decreased ability to solve your problems. Okay, they're also expected to have your bowel, bladder, and sexual dysfunction. Okay, of course, that is related to demyelination. And then you have your talipis equinus or your foot drop. Okay, then... Uh, laboratory findings class, recall earlier in GBS, the CSF would have increased in protein. This time class, if I'm doing a CSF analysis, okay, there will be an increase of your T lymphocytes and protein. The electrophoresis class could even allow for um, increasing or detection, I mean, of increasing levels of IgG. So class, when I say electrophoresis, this would involve the separation of charged particles or ions under the electric field. Okay? Then, you have your MRI. Class, the purpose of your MRI is to detect for the presence of multifocal lesions in the white matter that would indicate plaque formation. So again, plaque formation is one of the diagnostic criteria for your multiple sclerosis. Okay, again, the presence of plaque. Then, second is your CT scan. And then, class, you have your PET, okay, your positron emission tomography. And then, class, you have your evoke response test. And then, we also have your EEG. So, when I talk about evoke potential test or response test, that would measure the time it takes for the nerve to respond to the stimulation. Okay, so in this case, class, your stimulation will be, uh, okay, your stimulation could be your uh, healthcare provider awakening you or they could be using some bell to evoke your response. So, uh, this is usually caused um, or investigated further in multiple sclerosis. Then you have your EEG, of course, if you would want to rule out your cardiac problems. Then you have your medical management. So class for your multiple sclerosis, the management is your interferon beta 1A, and then you also have your interferon beta 1B. You also have your glatiramer acetate, and then you also have your triflunamide, and then you also have your fingolimod, dimethyl fumarate, and then you can give your IV methylprednisolone. So recall that your methylprednisolone is considered to be a steroid. Okay, so again, wonder why do we have a steroid? Your problem here is autoimmune in origin. So meaning I would want to depress the immune system, okay, for me to uh, solve the signs and symptoms of your patient. And then you also have your mitosantrone, okay, mitosantrone. Now, 
other drugs that could be given for a patient with multiple sclerosis. You have your baclofen, you have your dantrolene. Plus, baclofen and dantrolene are indicated for muscle spasticity. You also have your probantin and benstropin. Plus, your benstropin, commonly known as cogentin, are anticholinergic agents. So, these are indicated for bladder spasticity. Okay, so if you look at the signs and symptoms of your multiple sclerosis, it is more towards your spasticity also. So, class, your probantin again and benstropin are anticholinergic agents intended for bladder spasticity. Okay, so meaning uh, this medication would help the patient expel the excess urine. And then you have your carbamazepine. So, class, your carbamazepine uh, or your tricyclic antidepressants, okay, they are good for paresthesia. Still on your pharmacologic management, notice that we can give your amantadine hydrochloride. So, common brand for that is Symmetril. So, class, your amantadine is intended to address fatigue, which is, again, the major symptom in your multiple sclerosis. Take note, the fatigue there is also related to the involvement of your CNS, okay, which means that this is a systemic problem. Then, you also have your propanolol and deral. Okay, so, class, your propanolol and then along with your clonazepam, along with your gabapentin, these three medications, class, could be used for your cerebellar ataxia. Okay, so when I say attack, when I say ataxia again, so that results to uh, in coordination of your muscle movements. Okay, then you have your uh, analgesics in case that your patient would be having pain, so you can use your NSAIDs. Then part of your management, so patients who experience severe deformity class of your Achilles tendon would have your Achilles tenotomy. So, in your Achilles tenotomy, transection of your Achilles tendon is done. So, this is a mini open repair okay, in order to release class the pain from your Achilles tendon. Then, you also have your diet therapy. You have your rehab, your speech therapy, and occupational therapy based on the specific needs of your patient. So, class, for your nursing care, we know that your patient is at risk for fatigue. So, if your patient class is at risk for fatigue, you provide rest periods for this patient. So, your rest periods, that would include your energy conservation measures. Regular exercises may be done by your patient as long as it, that is, it is not strenuous, it, it will not involve aerobic activities. And then, of course, there should be rest programs. And then, uh, your patient would need to balance moderate activity with rest periods. It is also recommended for your patient patient's class to avoid extreme temperature because the heat class, other than it would increase the basal metabolic rate or the nutritional demands of the body, it would also delay the transmission of your demyelinated nerves, contributing to more fatigue. Okay, so you need to instill safety measures related to impaired physical mobility. Other than that, if we're talking about your eyes, so you might need to use your eye patch on the eye for diplopia. Then impaired verbal communication, chronic confusion, and then risk for injury. We also need to note that our patient may be at risk for complications such as your UTI. Hence, increasing oral fluid intake is very important. Also, class to prevent one complication, which is your calculi. Okay, so pressure ulcers is a very high risk for this patient. In other words, you should turn your patient every two hours. Respiratory tract infection may also occur for your patient. So for that reason, class, you need to suction your patients as needed. You need to educate your patient on cough etiquette and proper, proper coughing technique. Then contractures. So for your contractures, you need to position your patients properly to prevent uh, anatomical uh, drop or anatomical dysfunction of your organs. So, class for your contractures, this may be prevented by maintaining your patient in anatomical position, which is the ha position for highest maximal or your position for optimal functioning. Then, regular elimination is recommended for your patient who would have bladder and bowel problems. Okay, so you need to do bla bladder and bowel training. Then encourage independence still and then teach your patient if there is a need to use your assistive devices. Okay, They need to avoid fatigue, stress, infection, overheating and chilling, and increase uh, fluid intake and eat a balanced diet. Okay, So class, the balanced diet for them is low-fat, high-fiber diet. Okay, So that is for your multiple sclerosis. So again, class, in your multiple sclerosis, there is demyelination. However, the demyelination would involve your um, CNS, and that would be referring to your brain and your spinal cord. Okay? Now, the next topic that we'll be discussing is your myasthenia gravis. Thank you for your attention.